And now I have the privilege to kindly request and invite the panelists of the main debate e on EU border management and new concept. As mentioned in the welcome speech of our executive director, Europe has faced unprecedented migratory pressure and as a response to it, the European Union proposed a more integrated border management approach and one of the implications of this was the regulation on the European border and coast guard that was implemented on the 6th of October last year. Let me invite the panelists on the stage, Mr. Fabrice Lejarie. Mr. Mr. Laurent Mouchel, please. I, I would like to invite all the panelists right now. Sorry, to, we have not agreed on the scenario. Let me invite the moderator. Please take your seats. And now I will give the floor to the moderator of the discussion panel of the main debate, Dr. Roderick Parks. Thank you very much. I'm glad this is working. Um, the organizers tell me that our job this morning is to wake you all up. They've made our life easier by putting you in a very dark room and we can't see you, um, but I trust you'll pay attention. Um, my name's Roderick Parks. I'm uh, an academic and a researcher on these issues um, and uh, I'll apologize immediately for my English. Uh, I am English, but that doesn't mean to say that you'll understand me. So if you don't, please wave, I won't mind. I'm helped this morning enormously by having, I hope, a very good panel of, of uh, experts and practitioners to discuss these issues. Um, Fabrice, you've already met. Um, Laurent Michel has, has been introduced without music for some reason. Um, <laughs> Laurent, it's... Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, Laurent, I'm sure, is, is uh, known to many of you uh, for his work in uh, the European Commission uh, over the last almost 25 years, I think, most recently working as uh, Director on Migration and Asylum uh, in DG Home, uh, but with previous experience in the fields of energy and transport um, and the foreign policy side of those affairs. Um, so welcome. Um, Luis, I'll, I'll turn to you again. I'm, I'm sure a familiar face to, to, to many of you, Luis Gouvier, uh, a Portuguese uh, border guard who I believe sat on the uh, management uh, board of uh, Frontex for a long time, currently on secondment to ICMPD, and I never know how to describe the work that ICMPD does, so I might pass that to you later, um, but essentially an intergovernmental organization which helps its member states manage migration. Is that a fair assessment of? Okay, I, I can see you looking skeptical at me. They can't. Um, oh, yes, they can. Um, uh, and Philippe at the end, uh, an academic, again, I'm sure, uh, known to you from, from previous border, day, uh, border guard days. Um, working at uh, the university in uh, Brussels, formerly worked in the European Commission uh, drafting laws on immigration. Um, so welcome to all of you. I am going to, at some stage, make you work for your lunch because I will open the floor to questions. Um, I just want to do two or three rounds with the panelists first, just to get a sense of where we are with uh, the new regulation, uh, the new concept of integrated border management, and then I'll open the floor to you. Um, all right, I, want, I want to start with you, if I may. Um, when I talked to Luis, he, now Luis is clearly a troublemaker, but he, he reminded me of um, the fact that in 2013, 2014, 
Um, Frontex and uh, the European Commission held a sort of informal hearing on the need to reform the way we manage the borders network and whether there was a need for greater centralization. The answer came back from border guards quite clearly that no, there wasn't. Now then we all know what's happened in between. We've had the, the European migration crisis. So I think you know, the change is clearly justified. I'd like to hear from you though, your assess assessment of why the changes were needed because I hear two different justifications. One was that the Schengen area, like the Eurozone, was a kind of incomplete project. We liberalized things, we created this common space, but we didn't put in place the proper policies to implement and protect it. And so we've, we've sort of been forced to recognize the need that we need a stronger Frontex and we meet, need more centralization. But the second justification I hear is that we're actually facing a completely new situation when it comes to the management of borders, that migration has changed, that terrorism has changed, that the geopolitical situation in North Africa and Eastern Europe has changed. So I, I, I throw that question to you and I'll, and I'll draw on the other panelists. What's the actual reason that these reforms have been made? Which of those two reasons is it? Well, I'm not so sure I'm understanding your English. <laughs> but more seriously, I think it's, the answer is both. I think there was a need to protect Schengen. Uh, if you want to have free movement of people within Schengen, you have to make sure that the external borders are well guarded. And we started with the assumption that this is a shared responsibility. And Fabrice, in his opening speech, has well described that. It's a shared border. It's not the border between Poland and Ukraine is not belonging to Poland. It's belonging to the EU, if you are, if you are part of Schengen. So that was the first re reason. The second reason, of course, was that we were facing migratory flows that we were not managing properly. We were not able to manage it. From a security point of view, we have terrorists. We went through the, through the Schengen area, coming back from Greece. From a migratory point of view, we were not able to have a system which was suffi sufficiently integrated, where reason was part of the answer, where the Western back and route was well controlled. So we thought that we had to put forward a new proposal and make Frontex a real Euro European and bo uh, border and coast guard agency. Let me remind you that we started with Frontex with 30 posts. When we started the, the agency, there were 30 people in the agency. Now by 2020, we'll reach 1,000 people. So it's really a change of nature. And we are asking now the agency to be really an operational agency on the ground, not only uh, an agency which is a cash machine for the national border guards, which is just to, to finance the operation in the different member states. But we have now rapid capacity forces which can intervene. We have the, uh, the agency we are checking the border in terms of vulnerability. So we are identifying where we have weak, weak spots and we have a concept of intervention with all the agencies to the hotspot where we are working together. Europol, EASO, Frontex, all together to provide uh, an appropriate answer to the migratory flows. So I think it's really a change of nature, and uh, I think it, it answers both. Protect Schengen, protect the fact that we are to get rid of the internal borders. Some have re-established internal borders, and we have to go back to Schengen on that. And secondly, face the new challenges of big, massive migratory flows with security risk which are attached to, to them. Um, Fabrice, can I pick up on that and with, with this sort of concrete problem? I get asked a lot, how did we miss the migration crisis? Why were we not properly prepared in mid-2015 when there was that shift? Is it the case that something new was hitting us or was it the case that the organizations weren't strong enough? Well, I, I think there were two, two reasons. First of all, it was an extraordinary event. We should not forget that there was an event out of the EU, this war in Syria, the chaos in the Middle East, 
So for the first time after the end of Second World War, there were so many refugees. So even during the, the war in, in the Balkan region in the 90s, there were less refugees on the road. So this is, first of all, an historic event that happened, and nobody seemed to have spotted this event. Then we had to cope with flows of mixed migrants, refugees, and irregular migrants trying to, to use the, the, these channels. And I think we, we had to cope with the system we had, and for the reasons described by Laurent. We had a free movement area, the Schengen area, but we had not the proper tool to manage this in, a, in the spirit of a shared responsibility. So for me right now, we are much more uh, equipped for that. We have resources. So the, 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 the budget has been tripled. The number of staff uh, is, is, uh, is being uh, now beefed up. We, we have the target of 1,000 employees of the agency in three years from now. We have um, more um, competences. Uh, the, the, the shared responsibility is something which, for me, is a revolution. I remember when I, I took office as executive director of the agency in January 2015, there was a taboo. Member states alone are in charge of border management. We will not replace them. And there was the fear that we might offend anybody if the agency could give some more support. So I think we have this shared responsibility. It goes together with the vulnerability assessment. And we have, uh, of course, um, now developed also new functions or clearly stated that we are also a security actors. And the fact that we have to interact with other actors, uh, the Coast Guard is not just a symbol, it's a reality because the biggest part of our external borders are maritime borders. So we have more than 40,000 kilometers maritime borders, so we have to, to manage them. And I think, well, other developments uh, together with the increase of resources will allow us to better manage the, 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 the work in the so-called hotspots, so to support the member states in fingerprinting, registering uh, migrants, in uh, carrying out security uh, screening, and beefing up and structuring return operations at EU level. So I think this is now we have uh, the, the full um, the full range of activities related to border management. Thank you. I'm, we've had the diplomatic answers. I'm going to bring in the troublemakers now, Philippe. Um, if, if I understand your, your papers correctly, I, I think you think Frontex is anyway on the path to become a far more centralized and far more powerful organization, and that's precisely what we need if we want to manage these problems properly. Um, but we're sort of in denial about that politically. Um, is, is that a fair assessment? Um, uh, are, where, if you like, the drivers behind the latest set of reforms pre-programmed even before the migration crisis, are we inevitably set on this path? Yes, I think that um, you're right. And uh, uh, maybe to come back uh, with what happened with the uh, refugee, so-called refugee crisis, which actually I think was not a refugee crisis, it was more uh, an institutional crisis, because I think that uh, in the future uh, it's possible that this moment will be seen as the period where there has been a beginning of a shift from implementation by member states towards uh, implementation by the European Union, which is very new, goes against uh, the basic principle that uh, EU law and policies are implemented by uh, member states. And this is the idea of 
shared responsibility that Fabrice Leggeri uh, has uh, just uh, uh, mentioned. Now, within this evolution, I see two elements which I have, uh, about which I, I wrote a paper. I see that uh, this, the new agency corresponds to a new model, but a model built on an old logic. Which is the new model? Well, the new model is the fact that we see, uh, bit by bit, uh, uh, an evolution from a flat network, where Frontex was one uh, of uh, uh, the uh, players, towards uh, a network uh, based on a kind of hierarchy, where Frontex uh, uh, become uh, the kind of uh, uh, chief of uh, the uh, national uh, uh, border guards. And I see that through, for instance, the vulnerability uh, assessment. Uh, I see Laurent Michel and Fabrice uh, reacting to that. Uh, they will probably not agree with that. Good, we will have a debate. Because I see that behind that, you have the beginning of a kind of control by Frontex of the member states. Of course, this language is not used uh, in uh, the new regulation, because that's not very pleasant uh, for member states, but I think that uh, it is uh, the beginning of uh, that kind of uh, uh, logic. Now, the, what is the old logic? Well, the fact that this regulation is still uh, based on uh, member state responsibilities that is privileged over solidarity. Despite the progress, because some progress has been done through operational uh, solidarity, which is easier form of solidarity than, for instance, physical solidarity, if you uh, compare that to the area of uh, 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 asylum and the issue uh, of uh, relocation. But despite that progress, we are still in the logic where Frontex actually is helping the member states who remain the uh, responsible uh, actors for border control. And I don't think that uh, this will remain in the future because uh, it will be impossible for uh, states like uh, Greece uh, and Italy due to the fact that this doesn't provide enough solidarity. Thank you. I'm I will move on in the next session to precisely these issues, so, so don't worry, you'll get a chance of reply. Luis, I just wanted to, to give you a chance, firstly, to explain what the hell ICMPD is, and, and maybe to help me so that I can, I can introduce you better next time. Um, but secondly, maybe to ask, you have a practical perspective, you know, have more of a, of a sort of think tank academic perspective, perhaps. What do you think is the next challenge that is going to hit us in terms of migration, in, in terms of border management, and are we now well stocked to deal with that so that we don't miss the next challenge? Okay, uh, thank you. I will start with ICMPD. So ICMPD stands for International Centre for Migration Policy Development. It is an intergovernmental inter organisation based in Vienna, but we do not only work for the member states of the organization. In fact, we are implementing a lot of EU projects, and um, both at the technical level, but mainly I would highlight the support and facilitation of the political dialogues of the European Union, and in particular with Africa, which is the project that I'm coordinating for the moment. So now going uh, to the question that uh, brought us here. The question is not new. Um, the question whether or not we should have a European border guard. Um, actually, the first study on the topic was done in 2002. Um, and it's an, uh, a normal question because we have a European border. So uh, in that sense, it, it's logic that we should have a European border guard, which is established by this regulation. Um, what is not necessary is that this model corresponds to the normal model of having one centralized institution responsible for the management of all the borders. Uh, the model we have is a network model, where we have one agency, which is Frontex, European Border and Coast Guard Agency, and we have the member states' border guards. And um, 
In that sense, this regulation attributes uh, new tasks and responsibilities to the agency within this model, but both constitute the European border guard. And uh, this is a very important step. In fact, I analyzed uh, the regulation. For me, uh, the regulation is a breakthrough regulation in terms that for the first time we speak about European border guard. We belong to a European border guard system. Um, and this is fundamental to create cultural institution. Um, a, a, border, a European border guard cannot be done only by legislation. You should install and create in all the border guards, from the Atlantic to the eastern border, from the North Sea border to the Mediterranean, the sense that they are European border guards, because we have a European border. So in that sense, I think that this regulation opens um, this uh, creation of an institutional European culture for border guards. And in, in that sense, it's a very important step forward, I would say. Lovely. Thank you, Laurent. Let me come back to you. Um, I, I want to turn the discussion more precisely to, to integrated border management and what it means. A lot of organizations are promoting the idea of integrated border management or coordinated border management or comprehensive border management. Everything from, from the World Bank to the OSCE, the Organization for Security Cooperation in Europe. Very often it means that they want to be managing uh, borders. It's integrated around a certain organization. Um, as we've seen, the new regulation means a centralization of power. But what does it actually mean in practical terms? What's special about the European concept as it's emerging of integrated border management? Well, well I don't think it's about centralization of powers. It's not about controlling the member states. It's about having a system which works. And the fact that there's not a simple answer, controlling people at the border crossing point is not enough. You need then a process. Some people will go into asylum, some are irregular migrants who are, who are going straight forward to a return procedure. So everything has to be integrated. And we need to ensure that the whole system works altogether. So for instance, the vulnerability assessment is not to control if the member states is doing properly its border control, is to identify the weaknesses at our border, where there's pressure, special pressure, and where we need to add forces when we are to add manpower. So that what it means, integrated border management, it means that we have a common answer which is well structured. And in some member states, the organizations are quite complex. You've got different bodies, and with a lot of overlap of competencies between coast guard, border guards, and you name it, um, custom authorities. So what we are trying to do is create more rational into the organization so that we have a rational answer when the people are, are coming into Europe and they're treated according to their merits, their cases, and with the right answer. So that's what it means, integrated border management for me. Um, Fabrice, is Frontex still the right organization to be carrying this out? The reason I ask is because if you follow its development um, over the last 12, 13 years, it seems to have gone from a soft regulatory agency connected with the internal market, um, spreading best practice, essentially trying to get the flow of goods and people into Europe and out again as smoothly as possible. It seems to be transitioning a little bit into a more executive agency, um, focusing more on law enforcement and crime fighting, um, so more powerful perhaps, but also narrower in what it does. Is that a fair assessment or have I misread the regulation? Well, I think that the the development of the, let's say, the, the old Frontex uh, that started in 2005 was uh, from the beginning uh, strongly linked to the development of the, the Schengen free movement area. And in that sense, I would say that uh, the, the reasoning behind was that there was a need to have uh, 
proper border management, proper law enforcement at the external borders. But it's true that uh, gradually uh, the agency, and now with the, with the last uh, regulation that entered into force last year, um, we have more um, clearly um, powers um, to effectively uh, be present in the field. But we should not underestimate that uh, the agency was able to, to deploy joint operations, uh, that the, the, the members of the European border, uh, border guard teams uh, were able to, to have uh, implementing powers, kind of executive powers. Of course, it was always um, something which is legally tricky because we have sovereign states, we have the development of a union acquis, um, we have somehow a full-fledged common legislation. The Schengen uh, border code is our common Schengen legislation. There is an EU legislator, there is an EU court of justice, so one could say and that's what I say when I meet American counterparts. It looks like a federal system, but it is not. Don't be confused. It is not. It's something special that other uh, speakers uh, described as a, a common network. And this is maybe the, the special European way. And we have to, to we, we are all part of it, and we have to, to invent it and to, to well, to, to, to make it happen that we, we are able together to manage our external borders. Thank you. Philippe, does, does the special European way work? Um, what you've looked at in your work, I think, is, is the political compromises that the EU makes with its member states. And we've talked about a couple of compromises that go into, into the current system. One is the idea that Frontex offers temporary support um, in the case of um, a border emergency or a weakness. And you've suggested to me you find it very unlikely um, that once border guard teams are in place, that member states will be able to, to um, regain their independence of them. Um, and the other aspect, I think, was the monitoring dimension, the vulnerability assessment that there are a lot of checks in place before the Commission can actually act on those vulnerabilities and put measures in place, possibly uh, against the wishes of a particular member state. So, so does this special European system actually work? Well, it's difficult to say that it works when you look to all the difficulties that uh, we had uh, during uh, 2015 uh, with uh, uh, the crisis. Uh, but uh, the difficulty is precisely that we had to face this uh, crisis at, in a kind of transition from implementation by member states towards uh, uh, implementation by the European Union. But I totally agree with uh, Fabrice uh, Leggeri when he says that uh, it is not a, a federal uh, a system. It is indeed um, something new, which is not easy uh, uh, to describe and to put uh, into one uh, uh, category. There is the idea of an uh, integrated uh, network. Um, uh, I'm also working uh, about what's happening in the uh, hotspots uh, in Greece, where you see very interesting uh, developments because there is a very close collaboration between the Greek administrations and the uh, agencies and the uh, uh, agents of the European Asylum Support Office. And in Greek law, the uh, European, the, the agents of the EASO have been given some powers. So there, uh, I think that we can observe uh, the emergence of a kind of integrated uh, administration made of the EU level through agencies and uh, the uh, national uh, administrations. But uh, I think that the network model doesn't describe uh, uh, enough uh, the fact that a kind of hierarchy will uh, be uh, uh, necessary. 
uh, and that the network model as such is not enough. And, and I think uh, uh, that the idea of a European strategy for border controls is very interesting because Frontex is supposed to uh, propose a, a European strategy and then, if I look to the regulation, national strategies of member states have to be in conformity to that European strategy. So this looks like the beginning of a kind of uh, a hierarchy uh, between the production uh, of uh, instruments by Frontex and uh, what uh, the uh, member states uh, has to do. And at the end, I would call that a kind of maybe the concentrated uh, administration where the superior level is uh, European and uh, the member states uh, are uh, below. And I think that this uh, word is better than decentralized uh, model because decentralization puts the accent on autonomy of the execution. And actually, what I think that we need is uh, less autonomy uh, of member states and uh, more possibilities for Frontex uh, to uh, guide uh, the uh, network in view of a more, uh, what I call, uh, a hierarchical or deconcentrated model. Thank you. That's the theory, Louise. You've been out talking to people for your master's thesis. You've been talking to border officials, border guards, Will they accept these changes? And I'm thinking specifically of important things like risk analysis, sharing information. There are new rules in the regulation. The border guards and border authorities need to share information with Frontex. Will they do that? Will they accept the new rules? Do they understand them? Yeah, good question. Uh, yes, I think so. Uh, to be honest, uh, I think so. I think that whatever uh, the model you you um, defend for uh, for the European border guard, you have to have in mind that uh, uh, in the end you need the border guards. So it has to be always uh, a joint effort to come up with um, a more efficient uh, border management. And in that sense, what I um, feel uh, that in the field there is this openness to work together in this partnership um, spirit, uh, agency and national border guards. Um, and uh, the way uh, people look at the new uh, innovations, the, more, uh, could, the, the ones that could be more controversial, such as the vulnerability assessments, they look at it as actually as a positive uh, thing. Um, what their concern is that uh, this is done in uh, this true spirit of partnership and not uh, with other, let's say, uh, purposes. So, uh, and in that sense, I think it was uh, already clear from the opening speech and also for, uh, from the interventions, this is the way forward. It's working together and making the system that's created by this new regulation work as efficiently as possible. Because also we have to, uh, to bear in mind that in this uh, regard, I think this regulation went as far as it could have gone. Because uh, we have to bear in mind that according to the Lisbon treaties, internal security remains a competence of the member states. So this is already a limitation in terms of what model we want for our uh, border management. And therefore, we need to have, for the moment, this network model, and we need to make it work. And we could only do this if we work together in this uh, spirit and openness. So this is, uh, I think, the main message. Okay, I look forward to hearing if you share that assessment. I, I want to move now to, to more thematic issues. Um, uh, one of the things we've been asked to look at is the question of ethics, human rights, accountability, and so on. Um, Fabrice, can I start with you here? Sorry, do, do go on pouring your water. I don't mean to, don't mean to cramp your rhythm. But um, if you look at the press at the moment, people don't know whether to treat migrants as refugees or as potential criminals and terrorists. Um, I'm wondering how we deal with that in an integrated border management system. 
And this is a practical question in the sense of it's not just the media blowing this out of proportion. If you look at refugees, they will be displaced from their homelands for at least 17 years on average. They need to work, and if they can't sustain themselves near to home, they will move on to Europe, making them like economic migrants. We know that economic migrants on, on route to Europe are in extreme situations of vulnerability, and that blurs the distinction to refugees. And we know that both sets are putting themselves in the hands of criminals and terrorists in order to reach here. So we have mixed flows like we never had before. How do we deal with that at the border? Well, we, we have very professional border guards. <clears throat> we have uh, also common uh, standards at EU level. And for instance, we have the, the core uh, common curriculum uh, that will be launched uh, this morning, later on. Uh, so we have a common set of, uh, of standards to uh, know how to, to deal with the mixed flows of, uh, of people showing up at the external border. Uh, <clears throat> there are criteria <clears throat> to enter, <clears throat> sorry, there are criteria to enter the European Union and the the Schengen Free Movement Area. The Schengen Border Code is clear about the criteria to be fulfilled. The Schengen Border Code is also clear about the access to protection, international protection, for those who are in need of protection and are potential refugees. I think what we, we have now experienced in the so-called hotspot is that we, we need a swift process uh, together with national authorities of so-called frontline member states, together uh, with other EU agencies like EASO or Europol. Uh, Commission is also present in the, in the hotspot, so that we can make sure that the ones who have uh, good reasons uh, to claim for asylum can be uh, swiftly processed as asylum seekers and get out of this hotspot process and be settled somewhere and get a residence permit and a refugee status. The ones who can represent a threat have to be identified because we cannot accept threat. EU citizens expect from government, expect from the European Union that we protect the citizens. So if criminal organizations, if terrorist uh, organizations can misuse our border management system, citizens won't trust anymore their government or the European Union. So we have to be very efficient. And I think that in the last two years, in the hotspot, we had very uh, um, positive development that in fact, were reflected and taken on board uh, when the, the new legislation was drafted. 2016 was a little bit, or the end of 2015 and 2016, was a little bit difficult for us because we had to anticipate some activities that uh, would come soon in the, in the new mandate but were not in the, in, the, in the existing mandate. But the, the, to, coming back to your question, uh, we need to have professional uh, border guards, they are professional, and we need swift procedures, because the ones that must be returned must be returned quickly. Okay, thank you. I'm going to speed us up as well a little bit because we've got enormous clocks here and, and I want to get questions in. Um, uh, from you guys as well. Um, let me turn to you here, Louise. I mean, actually, on, on that issue, you've looked at issues of legitimacy and accountability and so on. I think, you know, one of the things that you've mentioned when we talked was um, the introduction of new oversight and accountability measures. Um, so the European Parliament and the Council with the member state governments acting with oversight of what Frontex does. But isn't the real problem uh, the question of trust and the need 
that Frontex and Border Guards are given the space to develop an esprit de corps, an ethos, and the trust to do their job, and aren't, aren't these sort of accountability mechanisms based on a, on a rather unhealthy mistrust of, of Frontex? So, so how do we build that trust? Well, um, I wouldn't say that the, um, the accountability uh, and transparency mechanisms are necessarily built upon mistrust. I would say that they are an important safeguard uh, to the public and they also help uh, to establish uh, the agency reputation as a legitimate actor in the system of, uh, of border management. Um, and it's true that uh, in the past there were several um, critics uh, to the agency that it was not accountable and that there was not uh, enough transparency. So I think that in this new regulation you do have a set of provisions that answer directly these uh, critics and that uh, show that um, for first the agency will be accountable between not for before not only the Council but also the European Parliament which is the House of European Democracy um, who, who will have a say uh, on the um, actuation of the, of the agency. So this is important. But it's not necessarily uh, based on mistrust. Actually, I think it's, it's the opposite. It's, it's a very strong contribution for a stronger trust of the citizens towards the agency because it really uh, shows and it makes more transparent what uh, the agency is doing in terms of the European security of its citizens. So uh, I don't see it in that. I, actually, I see it the other way around. Okay, glad to be corrected in that case. Philippe, can I, can I come to you? Um, Fabrice, I think, hinted at the, the importance of having a smart response, making proper uses of the available information and, and databases. Um, We've had a long argument in the EU, also in the European Parliament, about issues of proportionality, citizens' rights. Isn't the simple truth these days that we are so stretched for resources, that the migration flows are so large, that we really need to make any use of anything that will make us more efficient? Profiling, uh, data exchange, etc., etc. Or do you still have old concerns about, about the use of, of data sharing and technologies? Well, um, I think that there has been, uh, or we see now also the beginning of, a, of an evolution in the European uh, uh, Union uh, uh, towards uh, the, what, I, what I think we can call uh, uh, the American model, meaning uh, that uh, we collect uh, a lot of data, uh, as much uh, uh, as possible, in order to have the possibility to uh, dig in uh, that uh, uh, data, uh, if uh, uh, necessary, for instance, if there is a, a terrorist uh, threat or a terrorist uh, uh, attack. For, for a decade, the European Parliament has resisted that uh, evolution. For a decade, the European Parliament uh, disagreed uh, about uh, accepting uh, the passenger, the PNR, the passenger name uh, record. Finally, uh, they uh, adopted and they gave up. And I think that's a very uh, important uh, uh, turn. And there is indeed a very uh, important uh, debate regarding uh, uh, databases, in particular uh, the proportionality of uh, uh, the data that are collected, the length uh, of the period during which uh, they uh, can uh, be uh, uh, stored. Uh, there is an evolution. I think now political actors are more uh, and more uh, open uh, to this idea, what, what I call uh, the, the American model. But we still uh, have to be uh, aware that the Court of Justice will play a very uh, important role in that uh, uh, story. And that there we have uh, uh, another guardian uh, of the treaties than the European Commission. It is uh, the court, a very complex uh, jurisprudence, and we will have uh, uh, to see 
which position uh, the judges will take uh, in the future, for instance, uh, one day about the PNR or uh, later on uh, about uh, uh, ETIAS or the entry uh, exit uh, system. That's a, a debate uh, which uh, is pending uh, for, I think, a few years. Okay. Thank you. Um, th let me turn now a little bit more to the international dimension of this, and specifically to the European Union's international commitments. It's probably m most of interest to people in this part of the world. The way we've spread our border standards um, and bought cooperation from our neighbors is by lifting border controls, um, visa liberalization, and so on. Are we moving now in the opposite uh, direction, both in terms of reintroducing border controls to our neighbors, um, but also in terms of these technological um, advances? Things like the Trusted Traveler program seem to work against visa liberalization. It's very uh, individualized traveler programs. How do we manage that? Well, I don't think we are moving in, in the opposite direction. In fact, we are using technology to make sure that we are targeting the threat. With the visa system, we are putting some doubt on the whole country, on the whole population. Here, with ETIAS, with entry-exit system, we are targeting people based on risk assessment, individual risk assessment. So from a proportionality approach, I think it's much more proportional to target the people than just to target the whole country being saying, this is a bad country, we put them under visa restriction and we have special measure against them. So it's much more targeted. And let's face it, uh, we have to adapt to the new reality with the foreign fighters where we have EU citizens coming back uh, after fighting in Syria or Libya or elsewhere and trying to, to come back to Europe to, to carry a terrorist attack. That's why we have amended the Schengen border code with the systematic checks against all databases of EU citizens as well and not only uh, third country nationals. So these are developments according to the change of the world. And so the Schengen era is adapting also to the new, new reality. And in the field of external relations, of course we are doing uh, support of third countries in terms of border management, uh, trying to lift up the standards. But what we are doing, and which is new in the, in the new EBCG regulation, is the fact that we are negotiating now with third countries for the deployment of EU border guards on their territory. And that is uh, a real breakthrough. Now we are in the process of finalizing a negotiation with Serbia, so we'll have the possibility to have EU border guards in Serbia uh, to better control the Western Balkan route. And this is a real game changer. Because if you look at the, the situation in October, September, October 2015 and now, we have cut the route. Uh, not only because of the EU-Turkey statement, but also because the Western Balkan route is uh, better controlled. And this is one step further. So we are really do doing, uh, I would say, a quantum leap uh, with the deployment of EU border guards in third countries. And this is really the main change in, in, in the regulation. Okay. I mean, Fabrice, is there a risk here that we're doing the wrong things in the wrong places? What, what we've seen in the last couple of years is that the EU's security missions from overseas, its CSDP missions, are moving ever closer to the European Union. We've got um, Operation Saphir in the central Mediterranean. We've got militaries and navies acting at our border. And at the same time, as Laurent suggests, we're pushing our border guards out to, to hotspots abroad. Shouldn't border guards be at home and the military abroad? And, and doesn't that sort of mishmash represent a kind of deprofessionalization of both things? Well, you may see the w one side of the coin or, or the, the more positive side that this is integrated border management. Because in certain situations, for instance, Libya, who could imagine that civilian police forces, civilian border guards could go tomorrow to Libya or to, to go close to Libya 
to, to, to carry out some kind of cooperation. So I think wisdom is that we need in this area military assets. Frontex uh, was victims of shootings in the vicinity of Libya when carrying out search and rescue operations. So this shows that it makes sense to have military uh, deployments by the EU in certain part of, uh, of the world and in certain part of our neighborhood. But on the other hand, uh, it makes sense, for instance, in Niger, uh, or in, uh, as it was said, in the, in the Balkan region and probably in some other areas, to have civilian programs with the contribution uh, delivered by the European Border and Coast Guard Agency together with other uh, EU actors, together with national actors. For example, our liaison officer deployed in Turkey, our liaison officer to be deployed soon in Niamey and to be deployed soon in Belgrade. They, will interact, they are civilian uh, officers and they're going to cooperate with civilian actors. So, I don't see a contradiction. I think that this is also the, the, our strength, the strength of the EU, that the EU has different tools in, in its toolbox, and as appropriate, we can choose either military or civilian, or a mix of military and civilian tools. Thank you. Just a couple more questions from my side, and then I'll open the floor to you. Um, so if you've been sitting there thinking, I've been asking the wrong questions for the last 45 minutes, now is your time to make me look like an idiot. Um, uh, Luis, though, first. A lot of the processes that were involved in abroad, when we send Frontex officials to get involved, are highly technical. Um, you see the diplomacy that's required to unpin something like uh, the route out of West Africa. From what I hear, we're dealing with governments like Nigeria or Côte d'Ivoire that have an interest in getting their citizens into Europe. They've closed down their consular um, uh, cooperation en route so that their vulnerable citizens are essentially pushed on towards Europe. And it's us in the EU that takes responsibility for the humanitarian disaster in the central Mediterranean. That, that's a serious diplomatic problem to have to deal with. Is, is it right to be relying on Frontex and border officials to be taking on those kind of duties? Uh, well, definitely. I think this, uh, what, what you mentioned is uh, the main reason why the EU is carrying out the political dialogues on to how to manage uh, migration and mobility with, with Africa. We're actually, uh, the EU has two regional dialogues, uh, one with Western Africa, which is called the Rabat process, which is been going on now for 10 years, for more than 10 years, to be precise. And then for the Horn of Africa, it's the Khartoum process. Um, with EU and Horn of Africa countries. And in the, this uh, dialogue, which is very, very uh, much focused on uh, fighting trafficking and smuggling of migrants, I can tell you that Frontex participates uh, in all the meetings um, as an observer, of course, because this is an intergovernmental organization, but still there is an active participation of the agency. And uh, in the Rabat process, also, whenever there is uh, an issue concerning uh, border management, also uh, the agency participates. Furthermore, uh, in the end of 2015, uh, EU uh, leaders and African leaders launched another uh, process, which is the Valletta process, where they approved a political declaration and an action plan with very concrete actions to be implemented in order to uh, manage migration in a spirit of shared responsibility and partnership. And also the agency participates in these meetings. Uh, at the end of last year we had the first senior officials meeting to discuss how the implementation of this action plan is going on and there we also had uh, the agency. And I must say that from the African countries there has been uh, an evolution in terms of how they perceive uh, the issue. And for instance, you've mentioned Niger. Well, the fact is that we have a, an ongoing project in Niger of joint investigation teams where uh, police officers from Europe are working there together with the Niger 
law enforcement. So there is a change, and um, of course it takes its time, and it takes a lot of dialogue. This is why it's so important to engage in these dialogues, to bring them to the table, and to discuss together the migration management issues. Um, we also need to, to be uh, very clear that uh, border management does not solve migration crisis on its own. So uh, we cannot expect this from uh, the border management system. It's an integrated and comprehensive approach that hopefully can help us deal better with future migration crisis. Uh, Philly, uh, we don't expect border guards to be diplomats. Why do we expect them to be development experts? Why, why is Frontex getting involved in actions in Africa and our near abroad to build up border management standards? Is that a development task and is that something where, where Frontex belongs? Well, you put indeed uh, the finger upon what is called the nexus between uh, uh, migration uh, and uh, development. And what we see is uh, uh, an enlargement uh, of the notion uh, of uh, development, uh, integrating uh, migration uh, management uh, in general, including uh, border controls and even um, uh, return uh, of uh, uh, migrants, uh, difficulties can you include uh, uh, maybe voluntary return, but what about a, a forced uh, a return? There is also a discussion, uh, for instance, and this is um, led by the, the OECD that has a, a committee discussing to which extent uh, money spent by uh, member states to receive asylum seekers in the Union, uh, in the EU, can be counted as a part of uh, the budget uh, devoted uh, to uh, uh, development. So uh, there, uh, I think that we have a very important debate. What is, I think, interesting is to notice that 15 years ago, and I remember, for instance, the conclusions of the uh, European Council in uh, Sevilla, this uh, created big tensions between policymakers and politicians in charge of development with uh, uh, policymakers uh, in charge of uh, migration. This is not uh, uh, the case uh, uh, anymore. It seems uh, uh, accepted. But I don't think that it means that the question is solved. On the contrary, there is still uh, a tension. And the idea that with uh, more development, uh, we will have less migration is really uh, questionable. It is not as uh, uh, simple uh, as uh, uh, that. And, uh, uh, we still have to keep in mind, I think, the fundamental uh, elements of uh, uh, the development uh, policy. Ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's your turn. Um, I expect you've been sitting there thinking I've asked the wrong questions. If you, could, if you could wave your hands about if you'd like to ask something, and I expect we probably have someone with a microphone. Are there any questions and, and, and comments from, from, uh, from your side? Stunning silence. Oh, there's a hand. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Oksana Nazarchuk, the UC Secretary at Borders Unit. Uh, as I see some members of our gender equality platform in border security and management. I would like to see one more chair in the panel next year with a woman on it. This would be nice. Uh, my question would be addressed to Mr. Leggeri. Um, I was very happy to hear that Frontex is now thinking more about also integrating the custom services and now with the new function, the Coast Guard services into the practical implementation of IBM. Uh, the question is, uh, is there any strategy to do that? Thank you. Should I answer? Sure. I don't know. If it, it, it's probably worth collecting questions if, if there are others. Are there others?
Can anybody see anything? No. In which case, um, okay. In which case, I'll throw that back to you. Let, let me also throw in a, a sort of closing question of my own, so that you all, so that you all have um, uh, something to get your teeth into. Um, we've talked a lot about um, the changes since 2013, 2014 that, that brought us to here. The classic question: Look, look four or five years into the future. Pick out a, a, a migration or a, or a crime driver. Where is it going to take us in terms of response? Where do you see European border management in, in four or five years' time? Uh, Fabrice, if you want to respond to that and the question. Well, thank you very much for, for the question on uh, integrated border management. There, there will, well, there are already practices that we are developing in the field. Um, we have, uh, of course, uh, strong cooperation with Coast Guard because, in fact, we uh, deploy patrolling activities, maritime patrolling activities. Uh, Triton, Poseidon operations are maritime operations. And in, in this uh, regard, we, we have already developed some, uh, some practices and well-established practices. I also would like uh, to uh, refer to the multi-purpose uh, patrolling activities where uh, we tested uh, in the last month um, cooperation with the European uh, fisheries control agencies, cooperation with the European maritime safety agency. So we were able, uh, in the course of Frontex operations, we were able to seize uh, um, drugs, so this refers also to the cooperation with uh, customs. Um, we contributed to uh, the seizure of more than 90 uh, tons of, uh, of drugs. We contributed to um, uh, fight against uh, illegal fishing. We, we had on board our vessels um, fisheries inspectors deployed by the European Fisheries uh, Control Agency. They were able to collect evidence uh, for the first time. Uh, now the question for them is whether this evidence uh, can be used as criminal evidence uh, in the court, in national courts, but this is another topic and this is not for Frontex, but maybe this is a, a, an issue for the EU in terms of law enforcement. Um, concerning the customs, we are now uh, developing our contribution to the so-called policy uh, cycle, the impact, but also uh, we, we contribute to activities uh, planned by by the the customs uh, cooperation working group of the of the council, uh, with a strong um, focus on uh, weapons trafficking uh, from Frontex side. So you see that we directly contribute to something that is fight against organized crime, fight against terrorism. So this has an impact to have safer external borders in order to secure. Uh, or to contribute to a, a more secured uh, internal free movement area. Whether there is a strategy, uh, this will be structured in the, in the, in the coming uh, month. Uh, we, we have already started the process with the, with the Commission. Um, other EU institutions will be involved, uh, the Parliament and the Council. And when we will have this, let's say, political uh, layer of integrated border management strategy, then we will uh, develop as an agency together with our stakeholders, uh, we will develop the operational uh, strategy for integrated border management. And then uh, member states uh, will have to adapt or to create uh, their own integrated border management strategy. So, in a nutshell, we, we have practices, now we need to structure them uh, so that we have a, a clear-cut strategy. Yes, in, in terms of challenge for the future, I, I think we are facing a huge challenge in the coming years, which is demography in Africa. I mean, let's face it, uh, in some countries like Niger or Guinea, you have 70% of the population below 18. 25% of the girls between 15 and 18 are already pregnant. The population is going to double in the next 12 years. 
and we don't have good identification means. They don't receive a birth certificate, they don't have a valid passport, they arrive in Europe and we have a difficulty for, of identification. So one of the challenges is to have biometric data for the whole African continent so that we can identify who is coming. The border guards is gonna be key that we have good identification system and good database so that we know who's coming and that we can process return. Return would be a key element in our policy if you want to control the migratory flows. So, ID system, return procedures, and also appropriate security screening. I think that uh, we have learned the lessons hard over the last two years, and we need to integrate much more uh, the border work with the police work. The work of Frontex with the work of Europol, and also at national level. Security screening will be one of the key also for the future. These are the challenges in the coming years. Yeah, oh, well, I fully agree with this analysis. Already we are facing uh, huge challenges. Of course, demography is, uh, is one of them. And uh, we have to, uh, to have in mind that the next EU-Africa summit that will be held in November this year will be on the topic of youth and employment, because really this is a, a huge, huge problem for, for Europe. So um, the pressure will still be on the borders. Um, and of course, we can also uh, count on unfor or unforeseen events to uh, even increase uh, this pressure. I think that uh, in the near, in the coming years, it will be very interesting to see how this model uh, created by this regulation will work, uh, how efficient it will prove uh, to be, and a lot of uh, what will be coming will depend also on the conclusions that we uh, will take about this um, performance of the of the of the model. Uh, in my personal opinion, and having analyze what has been uh, the path uh, until today, I think we can expect for more integration in the future and to have um, an increased role of the agency in terms of ensuring a rational and efficient use of assets and uh, human resources, I would say. Thank you. Well, I would say that uh, uh, in the future, uh, we should probably push as much as possible operational solidarity, because it is the easiest form of solidarity that we can establish between uh, EU member states, uh, easy, much more easier uh, than uh, physical solidarity like relocation or a pure uh, uh, financial uh, uh, solidarity. Now, this uh, being said, I think that there is another challenge for the European Union that one uh, to uh, respects is uh, values and uh, human rights. The fact that uh, actually what we now see happening is not, in, is not a pushback, but actually what I would call pullback uh, uh, operations. Uh, and I refer to a, a recent uh, uh, incident where uh, there was a, a boat uh, to uh, rescue uh, and the choice was between uh, Libyan Coast Guards uh, or uh, an NGO. And the solution was uh, to uh, give a priority uh, to the Libyan uh, uh, Coast Guards. That can be uh, acceptable from the point of view of the law of the sea, uh, maritime law, but I think that we have to keep in mind that actually this is a, a pullback uh, operation uh, of people uh, from leaving Libya uh, to Libya where we know uh, that human rights, human rights standards are not uh, respected. So we are not allowed from the EU side to do pushback operations and, and actually we uh, favor pull uh, back uh, uh, operations. That's an extremely complicated legal debate uh, and I accept that, but I think that we should also keep in mind the moral uh, dimension. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, you get to, to go and have your coffee now. Um, please, though, briefly join me in, in thanking uh, my four panelists for their, for their inputs uh, this morning. Well done, you survived. <laughs>